So welcome. Thank you so much for coming to the third of our virtual lectures, which are in celebration of the centennial of Lehman Caves National Monument. So 100 years that we've known about Lehman Caves and the park is really excited to celebrate that this year and Great Basin National Park Foundation is, is helping um, by connecting you wherever you live more deeply to the park. I just want to um, really briefly let you know Great Basin National Park Foundation is the nonprofit partner of Great Basin National Park. And uh, what we do is try to help preserve and protect this most amazing special place for present and future generations. And we do that through helping um, support research, interpretation, education. Um, we do a lot around the Dark Sky Initiative at the park. So we're supporting um, interns that help with the astronomy programs. And we created um, the first and only research grade astronomical observatory located in, in a national park. We do a lot um, of youth programs and um, other things for the park visitor experience like wayside exhibits and those kinds of fun things. Um, and so we'd love for you to get to know us a little bit more. And I'll, after this uh, lecture, um, Early next week, I will send an email to um, everyone who registered with links to our previous lectures. So the first two lectures were focused on the caves. Um, they were both really fabulous. So if you miss those, you can watch those on the recording. Tonight, we're um, going to learn about the geology. So looking at a much wider view beyond the caves, but obviously super linked to the caves. And then the next two lectures, we're going to be zooming in on some particular very interesting species at Great Basin National Park. And we're going to learn from park experts about rattlesnakes, the Great Basin rattlesnake, and the Bonneville cutthroat trout. So I hope you'll join us for those. They're both also on the first Wednesday of the month at 6 Pacific time. So I am very happy that our superintendent, James Woolsey, is here tonight to introduce our speaker. And without further ado, oh, wait, sorry. One thing before I turn it over is that um, we will have question and answer at the end. Um, so please feel free anytime you can put your question in to that Q&A, which you should be able to see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, you just hover over that. You should see Q&A. Throw a question in there anytime. We'll get to that at the end. If for some reason Q&A doesn't work for you, throw it in the chat and we'll get to that as well. So now I'm going to turn it over to um, James Woolsey, our superintendent. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm James Woolsey. I'm the superintendent at Great Basin National Park. Um, it's an honor to be on, on online with all of you. And, and thanks to all of you for helping us celebrate um, the 100th anniversary of the creation of Lehman Caves National Monument and by extension, um, Great Basin National Park. It's my um, absolute privilege to be able to introduce Elizabeth Miller. She is an amazing person. You're going to all really enjoy her. Um, she, she is a professor of, of geological sciences at Stanford University. Um, she's won all kinds of awards. She won an annual excellence and teaching award, um, a career contribution award. Um, she's done all kinds of field work around Great Basin National Park. However, the things that I'm most impressed with are two things that we're going to talk about. The first is, is Kenji and myself, we took a class with Elizabeth um, over, over the COVID, and it was one of the most amazing academic experiences I've ever experienced. And, you know, Elizabeth, the way that she did that class, and there was just this swirl of professors and students that, that kind of circled around Elizabeth. And to watch this community of people think such long-term, uh, it was really amazing to, to see that community and, and, and really what Elizabeth does um, to help young and old learn about the world. It's amazing. And then finally, I think, and this says a lot about Elizabeth's character, her two children are named Wheeler and Egan, and they're named after some of the, the really nicest peaks that are located in our area around Great Basin National Park. So without further ado, Elizabeth, I, I will turn it over to you and, and thoroughly enjoy another one of your lectures. <laughs> it's like really quite an honor to be with all of you tonight. And uh, <clears throat> uh, I, that my talk tonight is really about uh, how the Great Basin National Park really has little bits of the history of the West 
going all the way back to its inception 600 million years ago. It's quite amazing that that history is encapsulated in the Great Basin National Park. Um, most of us think of it as just another mountain range in the basin and range. So on the bottom there, you see <clears throat> the endless sets of mountains and valleys that you cross when you drive Highway 50 to the Great Basin National Park. And probably some of you at least know that the valleys are there and the mountains are there because they're bound by uh, uh, extensional normal faults that formed as you kind of pulled the basin and range apart. And they're either a series of tilted blocks shown in the upper diagram, which are called half grobbins with a fault on one side, or they can be a full grobbin with a fault on either side of the valley. So the Snake Range has its main fault on its eastern side, both the southern and the northern Snake Range, which are down here at the bottom at the bottom of the, um, the screen here. So um, although it's just one of many basin and range fault blocks, its history is much, much longer than that. The, uh, basically, the basin and range faults formed in the last 17 million years or so. And uh, the history goes back much longer than that. So um, you know, what does it take to really understand the geology of an area, like really know it very well? Um, you need a very good geologic map, and anybody who makes a map relies on everybody who made maps before them because it's a lot of work to make a map, and you just kind of build on the shoulders of the giants who mapped before you. And some of the people who did the first maps of this area uh, were Hosen Blake in 1976, who made, um, uh, wrote the Geology and Mineral Resources of White Pine County. And it's a bulletin that you can buy from the Nevada Bureau of Mines. And their map was at one to 100,000. And then slightly um, before that, uh, Don Whitebread made a map of Wheeler Peak and Garrison Quad. So those are covering the Great Basin National Park. And uh, that was published in color and is one of the ones that we use to, to work in this area. And it was, um, it was these authors and some other people working at the same time that discovered that the, the southern and northern Snake Range were very peculiar mountain ranges in terms of their faulting history, and that they basically consisted of these big domes of older rocks, which are shown by the colors, the red and the brown and the black in the southern Snake Range, like big domes of older rocks. And then they had a very gently dipping fault system that surrounded these rocks. And then everything that was younger than that was all chopped up in little bitty pieces in the upper plate or the top part of that fault system. And so that's really what's defined the unusual, really unusual geology of this mountain range. And it turns out that no one agrees or still do not understand how this fault system formed. There's a lot of arguments still um, today. So these guys started it off and then we came in here and we mapped uh, beginning in 1981 and finished mapping the Southern Snake Range in 1995. And we did our mapping at one to 24,000 or less. So pretty detailed. And we relied on <clears throat> a tradition that's no longer in place at Stanford called the Stanford Geological Survey, which was a capstone experience for our geo majors, a 12 unit class where we spent six weeks in the field and then four weeks making our final maps of report writing. So we had a very energetic army with a lot of strong legs um, back in those days. And that was great. And here's uh, in the Northern Snake Range playing with the uh, swords of quartzite up at the top on the way up to Mount Moriah um, in the quarries, uh, playing with slabs of quartzite that you could see used uh, in the Great Basin National Park for building stones in and around the parking lots and campgrounds. And here we are hanging out in at the headwaters of Strawberry Creek with the camp managers um, who did all of the cooking and shopping. And here we are eating dinner at the headwaters of the Hampton Creek Trailhead, which takes you also up to Mount Moriah. And it was kind of our home away from home for six weeks. And then back at Stanford, working on the maps and the final reports. There's a lot of work involved. And we did this over and over again, year after year, and produced some very detailed maps. And this is the Northern Snake Range. And uh, you can see the different unit contacts and detail that hadn't been mapped before. This is the headwaters of Henry's Creek. And this is the headwaters of, uh, of um, Smith Creek to the north of Henry's Creek in the Northern Snake Range. And all those little black marks are 
places where people measured the attitude of the rock. So we really crawled around this mountain range and then the Southern Snake Range as well. So I'm very deeply grateful to all the students that worked um, in our field camps over the years. And I thank them very much. And I also thank even more the graduate students who helped bring all this work to final publication, wrote papers on it and interpreted the geology. And it, for one, Jeff Lee, who's sitting here in this picture, uh, Jeff Lee mapped a lot of the Northern Snake Range and he's still writing papers about the Snake Range. And he's now compiling a brand new one to 50,000 map based on all the a simplified map based on all of our mapping. So, uh, and I have lots of other people to thank the Great Basin National Park and the Nevada Bureau of Mines and the USGS for helping us get our maps out for this region. Okay, so we're gonna look at the 600 million year of geologic history, um, talk a little bit about it and where you see uh, the most uh, important parts of that history in the Great Basin National Park. So, I, I say that it mirrors the geology of the West, and it really does. Uh, the geology of the West, and um, James knows this, I hope remembers it from taking the class, uh, a very simple history of the West could be phrased as it began when it rifted from another continent 600 million years and, or so, maybe as early as 750 million years in the Precambrian era. And then that was followed by a very long, quiet time of continuous marine sedimentation. And that means that the Great Basin National Park was actually underwater from about 600 to 190 million years ago through the whole Paleozoic. That's a long time to be underwater. So not much was happening, pretty boring. And then uh, things kind of picked up in the Mesozoic where we had subduction along the Western margin uh, like we do in the Andes today with the development of a volcanic arc beneath the Sierra Nevada. And then that episode led to mountain building deformation uh, in the arc and back arc region uh, due to the, the crust getting shorter and coming together. And then finally, it stopped shortening and turned to extension. Um, and the area was blanketed first by volcanic rocks and then it was followed by the basin and range faulting, which creates the mountain we see today. So a very, very long history indeed. And if you want to look at this at a ch chart, I'll show you this chart throughout. This is the geologic time scale. This is when uh, the, the rifting began to form the west by this black arrow here. And then uh, this is the long, boring time of sedimentation all the way up to the beginning of the Mesozoic by this black arrow. And then subduction began after that, and uh, we started emplacing the granites of the Sierra Nevada. And some got all the way east here in the middle Jurassic, that's that red star, and in the late Cretaceous as well, it's that red star here. This is the uh, Cenozoic vul volcanism that blanketed the area. And then this is the time of formation of the basin and range faults that bound the Snake Range today. So, um, this history is laid out in the Great Basin National Park. We're looking at a close-up of that simplified map. Uh, these big red blobs here are Jurassic granitic rocks like the Sierra Nevada. And then these white areas here are Cretaceous granitic rocks, also like the Sierra Nevada. And then these gray, yellow, black, and brown units are the very oldest rocks in the Great Basin National Park. So when you walk up to Wheeler Peak, you're in these old rocks. And then this is the fault system that puts all the chopped up Paleozoic sediments down on this fairly smooth dome of older rocks intruded by granites that's exposed in the Great Basin National Park. So that's kind of how the units are laid out here. And we'll see this map again. Uh, when we begin our, our story of uh, rifting, basically, uh, you know, we're in North America and at 900 million years to about 750, we were surrounded by other continents and no one really knows which continent was next to us and which one rifted away. There's about four or five different theories, but this big continent was called the Rodinia supercontinent. And when it fell apart, that's when the West became the West. And uh, it, the Rodinia supercontinent, people don't really hear too much about it because it's pretty old, but you do hear a lot about the 
the younger supercontinent called Pangaea at 250 million years. And that's e an easy one to put together because all you have to do is close the present day oceans and put South America against Africa. So Pangaea is a lot better understood than this uh, old Rodinia is. And like I said, people think Siberia, Australia, uh, and even um, Antarctica perhaps were next to us before that margin formed. So how do you rip a continent apart? First, you have to heat it up and then you uh, get it really thin and it pull apart like taffy until it finally breaks and you form a new ocean basin um, and the two parts then move further apart. So this is what happens when you rip a continent apart. And after you rip it apart, what happens is the part that's been thin and stretched is much thinner than the rest of the continent. So you might be in the Rockies over here or the Colorado Plateau. And as you go west to where Great Basin National Park is, uh, you're in part of the continent that really sank and was covered by a huge pile of sediments such as these. So um, they basically, the continent's edges sink and they get covered with a blanket of sediment. And that blanket of sediment is represented by the strata or strata of the Grand Canyon, where they're pretty thin because you're on top of the, the, the main part of the continent that didn't sink, but it's got the whole series of strata uh, that range from the explosion of life at about 540 to 520 million years. That's when the first trilobites form, uh, all the way up to the Mesozoic, and then the area went non-marine after that. So that sequence is really important and covers the, covered the landscape here. And as you go from the Colorado Plateau, which is this section represented by here, and you come out to the west of Utah into Nevada and into the Great Basin, each one of these units gets remarkably thicker and uh, units are added as well. So this is the sinking part of the continental margin. And the bottom part of the section is all uh, it's all quartzites and shales, and the upper part is all limestones. And that's the same as you see in the Grand Canyon with the Tapetes and the Bright Angle Shale, and then going into the Muav limestone and the Red Wall and all of these that lie above it. So that section is represented. Uh, so this is the Egan Range, Shell Creek Range. So we're looking at, in the Great Basin National Park, a section of rocks that are uh, as much as 15 kilometers thick. It's remarkable thickness of uh, material. Okay, so um, getting back to the Great Basin and where you see these rocks, when you visit Stella Lake and hike to Wheeler Peak, you're basically in the oldest rocks exposed in the Great Basin National Park, like right around the lake. And when you walk from the parking lot up to the lake, you don't really see any rocks uh, actually cropping out, but you see all these big slabs of kind of bluish green rocks, and some of them have ripple marks on them. This is called the Osceola argillite, and it's pretty flat through here and underlies the Prospect Mountain quartzite, which forms Wheeler Peak. So you walk through the blocks of these blue, bluish gray, and if you look at them carefully, you can see evidence for um, little thin mud layers and sand layers and, and ripples um, and uh, kind of a shallow water environment, probably a delta, a marine delta of some sort. And sometimes you find actually uh, these like uh, mud cracks in the shale that are preserved evidence for occasionally drying out like, like a mud flat basically in a delta. And then um, as you walk, begin the, the, the steep part, you get above Stella Lake and go up into the path up to Wheeler Peak, you get into this massive quartzite. There's 3,000 feet of it that you walk through to get to the top of Wheeler Peak. And there's about another 1,000 feet feet that's been eroded off the top. So it's 4,000 feet thick. And it's just a big, massive quartzite that forms big blocks. And you can see these cross beds in them that uh, suggest back and forth currents in the shallow seas. So that's what you look at when you're gasping for breath and trying to hike up to Wheeler Peak. And when you're at the top, if you're lucky enough to have gotten up there, um, you see a tremendous view. Most of what you see is Prospect Mountain quartzite and it goes off all the way um, to the south, and it's overlain by massive limestones called the Pole Canyon limestone, 
up here. So it's a terrific view of those rocks. And uh, this is a closer view of the Prospect Mountain being overlain by the limestones, which is the, this part of the section, oops, the upper part of the section. Um, so we're looking at the contact between these brown rocks and the beginning of the limestones here. And this is an aerial shot of the, of the Pole Canyon limestone, the Cambrian limestones coming out through here, kind of flat beneath Mount Washington. This is Mount Washington. This is the Prospect Mountain Quartzite. And then this brown smear in here is called the Piot Shale. And that's the first place you get um, hard shelled fossils is in the Piot Shale. And localities in Utah are very, very famous. Um, and these represent the, basically the explosion of life at about 541 million years. So it's the beginning of uh, all of the evolution of the, you know, Shelly, uh, Shelly skeleton fauna, and then on up to everything that we are today. So, so that, that is a really important horizon and it's in the Great Basin National Park. Um, kind of hard to get to, but uh, if you're hiking up any of these, you know, off of Mount Washington, you get to that contact. So uh, Mount Washington is famous for these gigantic cliffs of Cambrian limestone. The Pole Canyon is, I think itself like 3000 feet thick, massive, massive limestones. And uh, to get up there, there's, this is like one of the, this is the road up to Mount Washington, going back and forth all the way up to the high peaks. And then you, it gets easier going up there, but it's a crazy road. Um, most, uh, you know, most people don't go up there. Okay, so that begins this long, boring history of limestone, more limestone, more limestone. And this black star that I put on here um, is in the Ordovician that's kind of halfway through this long, boring time span. And you deposit an interesting quartzite at that time that's here and there in, in the Great Basin National Park, but it's best exposed um, in the Confusion Range just to the east of here. And uh, this is a cliff of quartzite that's Ordovician in age. And it's, it's particularly conspicuous because it has a lot of limestones beneath it. And then the limestones above it are uh, called dolomites, meaning they have more magnesium than calcium in their calcium carbonate. And they're kind of brown weathering. So these are Silurian in age. And the Eureka, Eureka quartzite, which is the quartzite, marks the division between the limestones beneath and the brown dolomites above. So if you're driving uh, across uh, through the confusion range, you can see this on the south side of the road, look at it and see some of the nice stratigraphy where it's not really beat up by faults the way it is in the Southern Snake Range. So at that time, during the deposition of the Eureka, um, this was the equator. We were here, um, somewhere here in Nevada. This is Canada and uh, you know, everything was covered with shallow seas at that time. And uh, it was a time of deposition of sandstone all the way across the continent. Uh, the Eureka Quartzite is the equivalent of the St. Peter Sandstone, which is present all the way to Michigan, I think. But the world was very different back then. So the boring, uh, the boring set of stratigraphy goes up and up and up. And then when you're in Ely, Nevada, um, at both north and south of Ely, driving west out of town. You have lots and lots of hills and mountains made of this stripy limestone. And that's the Pennsylvania Perme Permian Ely limestone. And it's got a ton of fossils in it. It's a kind of a cool um, part of the section. Uh, and, uh, you know, so that's part of the getting towards the upper part of that sequence. Um, so here we go. We're, we're all the way up to the end of the, this is a, the Ely limestone is up in here. And then we go into the beginning of the Mesozoic. And this is when we start uh, having subduction along the Western margin of the continent. So it took a long time to begin, but it began, uh, you had too much ocean out there and some of it had to get subduct somewhere. So it started subducting along the West coast in beginning in the early Triassic. And uh, uh, during the Mesozoic, uh, that's when you develop your full-fledged, uh, we call it an Andean style margin because it's like the Andes today. And, and mostly in the Jurassic to the Cretaceous. And it's best known from California where you have um, out here to the West by San Francisco, you have um, what's called the Franciscan complex. And that 
developed in a subduction zone. So they're very deformed rocks that got scraped off the ocean floor and added to the continent. And then the Great Valley is this valley that lay between the Franciscan complex and the Sierra Nevada volcanic chain. And it's still there today, the Great Valley. And then we go into the Sierra Nevada, which as you know, is mostly granites. And the granites are basically the deep equivalents of a volcanic chain um, that existed during most of the Mesozoic or during the time of dinosaurs really on the West. And some of these uh, granites made it all the way east to the House Range and the Great Basin National Park. Uh, so there's like three pulses of magmatism that happened during the formation of the Sierra Nevada and, and placed granites in that area and two episodes of deformation. And they think um, it's because North America was actually moving west pretty fast and uh, it moved very fast in the Jurassic when you had your first episode of deformation and a lot of magmatic activity. Then it slowed up a little bit and then it sped up again until it slowed up again at the beginning of the Cenozoic. And so you have these Jurassic and Cretaceous and an earlier per period of magmatism that is not, not as well known. But um, if you look at all the ages everybody has collected on these uh, uh, granites across the West. There's definitely a group in here. This would be the Triassic group. This would be the Jurassic group, and this would be the Cretaceous group. So there is definitely an episodicity with uh, times between where you didn't have a whole lot going on. But this kind of, you know, encapsulates what happened in the Mesozoic. And uh, if you look at the, the Snake Range and the Great Basin National Park, the first magmas were intruded into the older rocks in the Southern Snake Range in the Great Basin National Park in the Jurassic at 160 million years ago. So these are these big red bodies in here. A pretty impressive bunch of granites, uh, very far away from the continental margin, but they're not, nonetheless quite there. And uh, they represent like this episode of magnetism in here. It's middle Jurassic, part of the Mesozoic. And, uh, uh, where do you see them? The best example is when you drive up Snake Creek and you hike up to um, Johnson Lake. I think this is Johnson Lake right here, this little frozen pond. And where, when you're at Johnson Lake in the summertime, it's very pretty and it's surrounded by uh, granites. And you look at them closely, you can see all the crystals and the granites. So that's one of the main uh, plutonic bodies that intrude the older uh, Cambrian and Precambrian rocks in the Great Basin National Park. And then we have another episode of magmatism represented by granitic rocks that are shown. Uh, it's actually a pattern here, but there's it's a kind of white colored. And here's another one over here. And uh, I'll show you what those are. One's in Lex Lexington, Lexington Creek and one's in Pole Canyon. And so they represent magmas intruded up here in the late Cretaceous. And uh, they're kind of unusual um, and becoming more famous as people study them, uh, but they are uh, very high in alumina and silica and they have uh, muscovite, which is a mica that's clear, transparent, and you can break into sheets. Um, so it's a uh, muscovite bearing, which is a very aluminous rich mineral. And most granites don't have uh, muscovite, but these do. So they're unusual and people have studied them. And this is looking down a microscope at a big blade of muscovite. It's a very pretty mineral. And they're generally associated, especially in the Northern Snake Range with very coarse uh, metamorphic minerals. And uh, these are starlight crystals. If you hike up Henry's Creek, you'll be able to see these metamorphic minerals. Starlight is an aluminum silicate and it forms these crosses. And then these little black things here are red, red garnets. So um, all in all, there was some pretty, pretty rocks developed here in the, in the late Cretaceous. And uh, the Cretaceous magma bodies, they come in, uh, they're illustrated here by these pink colors here. And these are the Jurassic ones that are older, uh, but they heat up everything and metamorphose things um, quite a bit. And if you look at the section, here's the limestones. Above them, these are the quartzites and shales beneath them that they intrude. And their composition is unusual because they're formed by melting of 
older continental crust. And to the east of here, uh, during the Cretaceous, you had, um, you had shortening by faulting called thrust faults, where you peeled parts of the sedimentary section and thrust it on top of each other, doubling things up. And people estimate that there is like 150 to 250 kilometers of shortening represented by these, these stacks of rocks stacking up on top of each other. And it also means that the rocks beneath them had to go down the tubes here. And when they got underneath at great depths, they got heated up and they added to the magmas from the arc and they were partially melted and um, turned into these very aluminous granites. So it's, they're pretty unusual, pretty interesting. And, uh, you know, like a, a, they've been, uh, you know, the topic of a lot of scientific um, studies to this day. Okay, so we're up here at the late Cretaceous. And then the next, um, the next episode is uh, a lot of volcanic rocks get erupted over a very large area of the West. And uh, the Great Basin National Park is no exception. Um, but they're not very well preserved here in the actual uh, Great Basin National Park. They're best preserved in the Confusion Range uh, to the east. And in this uh, Google view here, you see these brownish rocks uh, that come across and they're sitting on top of limestones over here that are part of the, the, the limestone Paleozoic section. And uh, there's an unconformity or an angular discordance between the younger uh, Cenozoic lavas and these older rocks related to that Cretaceous deformation. So this is what they look like from the air. And they're actually um, in a lot of places from here to Ely. This is another view of them. So you're looking at different volcanic events that covered the landscape. And um, uh, these are, uh, uh, most of these are ash flow tufts, which is a name uh, for a Pompeii-like eruption of uh, lavas that is uh, pyroclastic flow, you know, it shoots way up into the atmosphere and then comes down and it's a hot, uh, hot body of like pieces of magma and gas. And then it just like, it just runs across the landscape and it gets laid down as a ash flow tough uh, or a Pompeii like uh, eruption. So you can see these the best, like if you go up to Kalamazoo summit and uh, these are 35 million year old uh, ash flow tufts, and uh, these black things are called fiami, and they are blobs of volcanic glass that were hot enough when they landed to get compacted into pancake-like uh, features. So uh, these are called these are basically pumice fragments um, that got that got flattened during the formation of this ash flow tuff as it rolled across the countryside. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of these rocks around. You might run into them, maybe not in the Great Basin National Park, but definitely in the Shell Creek Range on Kalamazoo Summit. Okay, and then there's also some granites that are the same age in the Great Basin National Park. This is the Cretaceous Pole Canyon uh, granite, and this is the Jurassic granite. And then there's uh, uh, a mass of granite here um, in the Young Canyon Cayuse Springs area um, that is 36 million years old. And so that's the youngest plutonic rocks in the Great Basin National Park. And they're pretty important because they have a fault contact. And this is the fault, part of the fault system that bounds the Southern Snake Range and the Great Basin National Park. So it tells you that that fault happened after the intrusion of 36 million year old rocks. So it provides a good timing constraint for the formation of that fault system. And it's hard to go get to get to this one, but there is a little road that goes around here that, you know, if anybody's been up there, it's kind of dry. I don't think most people go up there to look at these, but they're there. Okay, so then that gets us up here. And then we get to the Miocene after the volcanic rocks are deposit. That's when the faulting begins and the snake range, be, you know, slowly becomes what it is. Uh, today or quickly compared to everything else that's happened. So um, this is the Snake Range today and the fault system that bounds it comes around its eastern side and through um, Sacramento Pass. So this divot here is Sacramento Pass and the evidence for the faulting is best developed in Sacramento Pass 
where you have lake bed sediments and conglomerates that are related to the uplift of the mountain ranges. Okay, so here's, we're looking at Sacramento Pass in a little bit more detail. Here's west, here's east. The highway comes up through here and you go over Sacramento Pass, which is the low area between the Southern and Northern Snake Range. And on this geologic map, uh, you can see that these light colored sediments represent these in here. And uh, the faults kind of scoop around. There's a series, there, there's one fault. Here's another one through here. So they take that section and repeat it over and over again. But these rocks are very young. They're Miocene in age like maybe 21 million years and younger. And they're actually cut by the faults too, which give you kind of a good bracket on the age of that faulting. It's the youngest you know, faults that occur in the area. And so the evidence that the mountains went up at this time are present in the conglomerates, which are uh, you know, sediments that have big boulders of everything that occur in the Southern Snake Range or like dumped down into Sacramento Pass as a as a result of that faulting. And you can identify pieces like the Eureka Quartzite, you can identify pieces of Cambrian Pole Canyon limestone, you can you know, find pieces of all of the stratigraphy that used to cover the Snake Range in the deposits in Sacramento Pass. And so these are dated by Tufts as 21 million years and younger, and they're cut by faults that are 17 million years and younger. So things are pretty tightly bracketed. And I'll show you kind of how that faulting happened to get you where we are today. And I'll show it, I'll go through it like a couple of times. And I apologize for this being a black and white picture, which isn't so uh, fantastic, but my slides from this area are very old. And I, I basically, I threw a lot of slides out. Um, this is from um, Al McGrew's master's thesis in 1993. And it, the cross section goes right across the Great Basin National Park, kind of right up Snake Creek. So this is what we have now. We have the old rocks and the Jurassic plutons and the Cretaceous plutons and also the, the, the Cenozoic pluton intruding all these old rocks in the kind of dome shaped core of the Great Basin National Park. And then this is the fault system that bounds that. And it's very complicated. It dips down and goes down beneath the confusion range which still has the entire section of strata like perfectly preserved over there, but it's all chopped up by faults here. So this is what it looks like now. This is after you restore these faults in here. And then this picture here is what it looked like before after you undo all these messy, messy faults in there. So now halfway back, and this is what it looked like before. So there was a huge pile of strata above the Great Basin National Park that's now preserved in the confusion range and is all chopped up by faults and eroded off the Southern Snake Range. So we'll go through this a little bit more uh, slowly. This is now. So everything that's dotted is up in the air. And here is topography coming across through here. This is the valley uh, be between the Snake Range and the uh, Baker and the Confusion Range over here. And there's actually like a well here that helps us figure out what's what's down here. So there's some ground truth here. So this is what it's like now. And then this diagram takes these faults here, which are kind of simple and puts them back again, giving you this picture here. And then you take that picture and you take all these complicated faults and move them all back again. And you get something that looks like that. So before faulting began, there was uh, maybe uh, seven, eight kilometers of sediments above the Jurassic granites and the rocks of Wheeler Peak, uh, which are now like part of the highest peak. So, so this is what it looked like before faulting. And let me see what I have next. Uh, yeah, so you, you start these earlier faults first and the, the, the bottom part of the Snake Range or the Great Basin, the, the old quartzites and Wheeler Peak this just starts going up and up and up in the air. Whoops. Okay, this is what it was like before. Then uh, you get all these messy faults and Wheeler Peak starts going up and up and the confusion range goes down. And then you end up with this big mountain range over here 
valley in between, and then the low-lying confusion range off to the east. So that's how the Snake Range Fault formed. Um, there's leaving you the old granites and the quartzites of Wheeler Peak and the Osceola argillite of Stella Lake, intruded by the Jurassic and the Cretaceous plutons, all in the lower plate of that fault system, which is shown by this heavy line here. And then all the faulted up rocks are present above that fault system, and they're all chopped up due to this um, episode of stretching. Okay, so just to summarize here, I'm at the end here, it, I'll, I'll use some cartoons. I, I gave, also gave a talk about the Great Basin Geology at Burning Man <laughs> one summer, and I had to use, I had to do the geology, was, couldn't have a slideshow, so we did it on sheets. So this was Rodinia. Uh, basically, this is when Great Basin National Park history began, when some continent rifted away from North America, and you deposited uh, tons and tons of sediment along that margin, ranging from uh, about 600 or so million years through the explosion of life, which is uh, 542 million years, that's when you had your first fossils, then all the way up through all this fossiliferous time here, and all the way up into the Jurassic, when things began to deform, and uh, uh, what was once underneath the sea became um, land again. So uh, that's a long accumulation of strata, long amount of time. And then uh, we begin the westward motion of North America with subduction along its entire western side. And uh, th this is when you emplace the Jurassic and the Cretaceous Plutons of the Sierra Nevada. And some of them make it all the way over to the east here in Great Basin National Park. And granites, remember, are the um, deep-seated equivalent of volcanoes at that time. So then, beginning in the Cenozoic, you really slowed things up and you begin to stretch and uh, you covered the west with volcanic rocks and then you began basin and range faulting. And I think that's kind of like, uh, that's how we got to where we are today. Um, the Great Basin National Park is a, a giant mountain range with faults along its eastern side that have been uplifted and uh, uh, Sacramento Pass is the debris from that uplift. Um, and uh, now it's just one of many mountain ranges in the Basin and Range, but it has a, a really, truly amazing uh, history. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. Um, so we have some questions from the audience and please go ahead and ask any questions and you can put them in the Q&A, put them in the chat. Um, Elizabeth, if you want, you could stop sharing your screen and then folks can see you better. Um, okay, so I'm just gonna go in order here. Um, someone wants to know more about the limestone metamorphosis to marble. They say, they wrote, is limestone the only rock that can metamorphosize to marble? And can it be very localized, only involving small pockets of an area that is not marble? Uh, well, the answer to that is not that simple because uh, uh, limestone is calcium carbonate and it recrystallizes very easily. Uh, when it becomes metamorphosed, you call it a marble. But um, sometimes uh, a limestone can recrystallize like just with waters going through it and you can get coarser grain calcite. And, you know, I, it's pretty like, it's kind of indistinguishable from a marble really. Um, probably the best thing to do if you wanna know how metamorphosed your limestones are is to look at um, uh, the, the, the organic matter in them that gets cooked. And that organic matter, there's different laboratory methods of figuring out what that graphite looks like in terms of its crystallinity, and it, it can actually tell you what temperatures it got to. And so what we know about the Snake Range in general is that when you go down, certain areas are hotter than others. If you're in the Kern Mountains, it's a lot hotter. Um, in the Shell Creek Range, it's colder than the Snake Range. But once you start getting down to the, the Cambrian, um, the temperatures were pretty hot, and you have, like in Snake Creek, you have the Jurassic Pluton coming right in and bringing its heat into the Cambrian limestones. 
So, you know, you can have pockets of recrystallization, but they wouldn't be, um, you know, actually uh, metamorphosed at high temperatures and, until they were really heated up, then, then that they'd be much more widespread marbles. Does that answer that? Well, thank you. Yes, I mean, I it doesn't have... change. Yeah, like a marble is the same composition as a limestone. It's just that limestone's finer grained, and um, you know, marble is coarser grained generally. Um, next question is: um, Someone asked about uh, what time period did the um, dead coal limit occur, and how long did it take? What event? The decolement, am I saying oh, that? Right? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, it, you know, the, this funny fault that, you know, surrounds the Southern Snake Range the great, that makes the Great Basin, and, uh, you know, National Park have its distinctive geology um, has been called, it was first called a decolement, which is a French word for ungluing. It doesn't really, you know, it doesn't really carry with it uh, interpretation of how that formed. It just means it's a surface where things behave, you know, by they deform by faulting above, and you can see all the faults and chopped up bits. And underneath, things are kind of flat lying and didn't get deformed by fault. So it's kind of it means an ungluing surface. So how long did it take to form? I don't know the answer to that, but it must have, uh, you know, it couldn't have begun much earlier than say uh, at the onset of the volcanism at 35, 36. And it had to have finished by um, like 17 or 15 million years when the faulting ended, or most of the faulting had happened. So it might have occurred in two stages. Um, there's a couple of questions about messy faulting. Uh, messy. So one is, uh, are the fault thrusts? Are the faults thrust faults? Are the messy ones? And one is. Um, what is the time range of the messy faulting and the big um, basal fault? When did each start and each end? So the messy faulting is just my, <laughs> it, 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 they're, they're all normal faults. And so the normal faults chop things up, but they're very closely spaced. And, uh, you know, it was with great consternation that we had the students map these things. And fortunately, you know, you can walk around and you can identify things like the Eureka Quartzite and the Dolomites above it and the limestones beneath it. So you can identify your units. And so you can actually put their contacts on the map and then they go for a little bit and then you have another fault, another fault. And they're all normal, they're all normal faults. And they are all coming into and uh, banging in, into this Tacoma underneath that, um, and it, they don't extend down to the rocks beneath the Tacoma. So uh, they're extensional. They had to happen in the Cenozoic. Uh, the earliest they could have possibly started moving is during the volcanism. And they were probably mostly entirely over by uh, 15 million years, which is the end of most of the faulting in the Southern Snake Range. Does that make? <laughs> Wonderful. I'm like a best answer I could give. So again, it's like a, you know, um, uh, the, the onset's not sure, but they're, they're not thrust faults, they're normal faults, and they happened either very quickly or in a series of episodes, one on top of the other between um, 35 or 30, 30 million years and, um, and 15. Okay, I see uh, two more questions here. So um, I have one question that is, um, how the older sediment, sedimentary rock is, how is the whole older sedimentary rock lower in elevation than the older quartzites, at least around the Wheeler Peak, Lehman Caves area? Uh, well, like when you're at, um, on top of Wheeler Peak, uh, you're, you're, the, the, the layering in the quartzites are near flat, and then it rolls over in this dome. So as you drive the road down from Wheeler Peak, uh, you can see the quartzites uh, gently dipping, uh, probably a little bit steeper than the road. And they go all the way down to, um, you know, close to Lehman, uh, Lehman Caves and the caves are in the Cambrian limestone. Does that make sense? Is that what the question was? Is how do you go from 
uh, you know, they 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 roll they're like a big dome. And so the the deepest rocks is the Osceola argillite that's exposed at Stella Lake. That's the deepest that you see in the Great Basin National Park. Okay. Um. So in a global perspective, how unique is the geology of the Western Cordillera of the Great Basin? Uh, you know, it, it's, it is unique. Um, there's parts of history of other mountain belts that are similar and people who study mountain belts and their histories obviously draw analogies, especially during the Mesozoic uh, in the Western US, we think things looked a lot like the Andes. And uh, so there are, you know, general similarities, but the, but the details are always really different. Like, you know, every continent rips, you know, rifts apart at a different time. It's sediments, if they're deposited in the tropics or carbonate, if they're deposited way far north, they may not be carbonate. The continents are like they're moving around. Like you know, what we have now was nothing like things were 600 million years ago. We don't even know what was adjacent to North America when it rifted away from whatever was there. So as you go further back in time, you get mercury. It, the history gets murkier and murky, murkier. But we've got this fantastic set of strata in the confusion range and the snake range that's just remarkable, really. That you know, it's basically a very thick version of the Grand Canyon succession. And it's got like every era represented, like every single, you know, it's just like a ticker tape through time. And so those are, it's kind of, we use it as our, um, our measure, like, because you know it so well, you can actually make a map of the faults or the thrust faults or anything that cuts it. So I think it's unusual that we have, um, I think it's unusual to the West that we have such a long history of sedimentation before deformation began. So that, that makes it really uh, unusual. Mm -hmm. And um, and that leads into our, our last question, which is, you know, so uh, so much of what you talked about tonight, obviously, is, is history. It's millions of years ago, millions of years ago. So the question is really about, does geology ever look to the future? You know, so what, we're at this moment in time. And, you know, is there is there kind of something within the science where you're predicting what's happening to all these rocks in the future or what it will look like in millions of years from now? Um, yes, I, I mean, I think that um, all geologists can take things into the future, you know, uh, at least a certain a distance and that distance is longer than any of our lives. Uh, we can study erupting volcanoes and their history and predict when the next eruption is gonna happen on average, or we can predict you know, when the next earthquakes might happen or how often they might happen, not with any, uh, you know, not with any precision, but we roll forwards as well as we roll backwards. So we have predictive capabilities for the future and plate tectonics can also be used to uh, push things to the future. Like we see which ways things are moving now and you can continue that story. But then if you have a big switch and things change all over the world, it might not be very, you know, that's when it, the change exists, but you can push plate tectonics into the future too. So a lot of what we do, it actually is the basis for pushing things to the future. It's a little bit harder to understand, like when you get the really short term things like climate change, um, you know, we, we have to sometimes take a broader picture, uh, but we're, you know, sitting here in an interglacial uh, stage, um, basically things were very, very cold and you know uh, the west was completely different 10,000 years ago uh there are glaciers and you know that's a whole different story that's not geologic um or at least not old history young really young geologic history but you know there are glaciers in the great basin national park and they're not there now and we're you know we came out of a glacial episode and now we're warming uh warming the world by burning a lot of fossil fuel that's been stored so you know, you can kind of predict what's going to happen, but you know, we're not going to go back in the glacial ages because we've warmed things up too much. Um, so we need to figure out what to do about that. Anyway, we do look to the future. <laughs> Absolutely, we we need to figure that out and all work together towards the solution there. Um, well, 
We have two more questions. I figure um, let's go ahead and do them. Um, for all of you who are still with us, uh, thanks for being here. If if you want to stay a couple more minutes. Um, so I have a, there's a follow-up question to um, uh, the question that was about like the Wheeler Peak and the, and the court sites. Um, and um, the um, participant asked, did the younger limestone that once overlaid the court sites get eroded as the uplift of Wheeler Peak occurred? Um, yes, because uh, like the southern part of the mountain range is not as eroded as Wheeler Peak is. And so that limestone went over the top of, uh, of Wheeler Peak at one time and has been eroded off. And uh, last question, did the historic faulting produce earthquakes with much greater magnitude than we currently experience? Or, or do geologists know anything about that? Uh, I, I would say say that, you know, all earthquakes are, you know, the same geologically as present day. Like we, we know a lot about earthquakes. We wish we knew more. We, we wish they actually happened more often so that we could study them better and, you know, understand that their patterns. Um, but we only get the earthquakes we do in our lifetime. So they're very well studied. And we know that the biggest earthquakes are on subduction zone systems like the, the Anchorage 1964 earthquake, uh, uh, Chilean earthquakes, and the potentially the one that hasn't happened for 300 years in the Pacific Northwest on the Cas Cascadia subduction zone. Um, these earthquakes rip the biggest chunks of, you know, chunks of rock past each other. Uh, they they actually uh, the size of the area that shifts during those earthquakes is like 800 kilometers by 300 and something kilometers, like a huge uh, distance really. And they shove, you know, the subduction zone rocks up over the seafloor and you get tsunamis. So those are like way up there in the eights and to nine point on the Richter scale. And uh, strike slip faults like the San Andreas can also be um, pretty devastating, but a little bit less uh, intense, like in the, the sevens to eights. Um, to almost a nine. And then uh, earthquakes on normal faults in the basin and range are generally six to seven. Um, and the Wasatch Front would be an example of that. So pretty serious, but not as serious as those other ones. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so, um, well, things, things haven't gone faster in the past or, you know, there have been, I mean, I think things have been pretty consistent in terms of the earthquakes that they've produced. Mm -hmm. the faults produced. Well, um, Elizabeth, thank you so very much. I mean, I think for all, all of us here, uh, all the audience and attendees, um, we feel very fortunate to have this incredible wealth of knowledge that you are um, giving to us through this virtual lecture. And it's, uh, it's so complicated that, you know, there's so much to learn, but I, I'm sure we all have gained a lot have, um, interesting. Yeah, I'd say that when you visit Great Basin National Park, you can just sit there and think about like how much geologic history is really there. That's a, a kind of a heavy thought, given that we're here now and, you know, there's evidence for things going on and life evolving 600 million years. And you're sitting right, you know, on those rocks that tell that story. I, I think that's, that's a very humbling um, feeling. And uh, I enjoyed talking to all of you. And if anybody uh, would like a copy of the slideshow for any you know reason, um, I'll be glad to send it to um, to James or to Abby whoever gets that to you. Yeah, to you. I could send it to you. Um, anyway, sure. that'd be so, great. Yeah. So just you know. Okay. Well, thank you so much. This has been great, and we have many people saying thank you in the comments. Um, so thank you so very much. We we really truly appreciate this um, experience, and I hope everyone will join us next month. And um, take care. Have a great night. Yeah. Have everybody have a great night. Thank you so much again. Bye bye. Thank you too. Welcome. And thanks, James, for your introduction.